Okay, ladies and gentlemen, ambassadors, uh, you're all very, very welcome here to the Institute for International European Affairs uh, for this event, which has been supported and co-sponsored by the Finnish, Norwegian, and Swedish embassies with the support of our own defense forces and particularly the Office of the Chief of Staff. I'd like to thank uh, the ambassadors and their staffs uh, for organizing the event alongside their respective defense attaches. Um, this is a, a comparative analysis, a comparative look at uh, women in the armed forces. Um, it has a particular Nordic uh, dimension, which is always very interesting for us uh, in Ireland, um, as we see many parallels with uh, some of our Nordic neighbours, and as Ireland redefines itself in European terms, and we move ever northwards uh, in economic and political terms, it's always uh, interesting to look at the Nordic experience to compare and contrast. Um, and I know that the, uh, that the Chief of Staff has, has, has had his own uh, very uh, uh, great priority placed um, in personnel development within the Defence Forces, and particularly in the recruitment uh, of women to the Defence Forces. Um, can I also say on a personal note, this is an absolute thrill, um, as the child of, of, uh, of military personnel, um, my mother served in the US Air Force uh, for a number of years and uh, never forgot to remind my father that she outranked him for the entirety of her career. Um, so I am, as I say, I'm delighted to, to, to welcome you all here. Um, just to, to run through the speakers uh, uh, very quickly, immediately to my right uh, is Chief of Staff Mark Mellet, who will be uh, well known to all of you. Um, I'd also like to welcome, uh, secondly, Emma Muller, who's a second lieutenant or lieutenant in the Irish tradition, uh, in the Swedish Air Force. Uh, she also studied at the Swedish Defence University. Uh, next to her is uh, Major Inka Niskanen uh, of the Finnish Air Force, and she teaches uh, air warfare studies at the Defence University uh, in Finland. Um, and finally, to my far right, and I'm going to make an absolute butchery of the name, and I do apologize in advance, um, <laughs> is Director General Kirsti Kleibo um, <laughs> of the Department of Competence and Legal Services with the Norwegian uh, Ministry of Defence. Um, each of our speakers will speak for about 10 minutes uh, on the record, um, and then we'll go to uh, Europe House Rules, um, effectively Chatham House Rules thereafter, so I'd ask you to respect that. Um, and I will leave the timing of the, uh, of the presentations entirely in the hands of our guests, because as military personnel, I know they are absolutely prompt and precise, so there's absolutely no need for me to impose any kind of discipline from the chair. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Admiral Mellet uh, if he'd address us. Yeah, I, I actually, it would be about 14 minutes, I'm sorry. And I, <laughs> if I go and start ditching some of it now, it would be um, very problematic. It's Your Excellencies, distinguished guests. It's a great privilege to be asked to contribute to the IAEA discussion on women in the armed forces. For two centuries, two features have defined the military world. Firstly, it has largely adopted a male definition of leadership. And secondly, the traditional view is that the, mil the primary measure of a military's effectiveness is its war fighting capacity, but these are changing. To be honest, serving for decades in our male-dominated organisation is not an ideal environment to gain an understanding of the importance of gender, the role of women, equality, and the significance of diversity and inclusion. That being said, understanding these themes are essential prerequisites for commenting on women in the armed forces. I'm convinced that institutionalising a gender perspective and driving diversity and inclusion are vital enablers for optimising decision making in a world of increasing complexity. Our defence forces is a key component of the security architecture of the state and when all is said and done it's, it's part of the bedrock which underpins our sovereignty, providing a framework for the institutions of civil society, where people are free, where the institutions of state function and where there is protection of the vulnerable. Human security is one of many emerging paradigms for understanding state and global vulnerabilities. All over the world we see challenges to human security and the institutions of civil society with a growing numbers of security consumers increasing especially in Middle East and North Africa and beyond. At home our defence forces is a security provider across three domains, land, air and sea, a jurisdiction which is almost three times the size of Germany where we have sovereignty or sovereign rights. But in the international environment where the appetite for consumption of security is insatiable our government has authorised over 600 Defence Forces personnel to serve in 14 missions in 14 countries and in one sea, predominantly in peace support and humanitarian assistance type operations, and women serve in most of these missions. The nature of complexity is growing with challenges in, so, in some cases being what have been described by Rittle and Weber as wicked. These are in some cases exacerbated by vectors such as climate change and population increase, probably feeding continued migration with the European pull factor of health, wealth and security, contrasting with the push factors of poor health, shorter life expectancy, poverty and insecurity elsewhere. 
Positive vectors include the growth in automation, robotics, technology, and explosion in data. Data underpins information, driving the creation of knowledge and understanding. And three things are clear to me. That if we fail to leverage open source knowledge available to us, we increase risk. If our enemy leverages data and open source knowledge available to them, they become more formidable. And the simple reality is that new technology and new ways of doing things are being created every day with the answers to challenging problems often outside organisational boundaries. This means increasingly we are going to have to innovate. That means networking and collaborating. Darwin said that in the long history of humankind, those who collaborated or improvised most, most effectively prevailed. And every way I look, I see that militaries are shifting from siloed mentalities to ones that are open and diverse, with diverse institutional arrangements for the provision of security. These are, arrangements are characterised by a desire for greater agility and openness to greater diversity in ex external networks, breaking down the walled garden that typically characterised the military. There's a growing recognition that the real strength of militaries is not so much just their capacity for warfighting, but rather their capacity for conflict resolution. Militaries are increasingly looking at the provision of security from the, from the continuum of the heat of conflict through the phases of stabilization, institution building, and restoration of civil society. Indeed, this is reflected in the prioritization of the integrated approach in the European Union. In the context of complexity, there are few things as challenging, indeed as wicked, as those that are associated with conflict resolution, where the effect of suboptimal decision making can have a devastating impact. In my experience, the greater diversity in external networks, the greater the opportunity for learning and new ways of doing things. And was having arrived at this position a number of years ago that stimulated my interest in researching how we as an organisation were structured to leverage our internal environment. A link between external and internal organisational diversity became apparent. In the past, militaries were often siloed, not having formal strategies for diversity and inclusion, and most of all, not having a real strategic approach to either institutionalizing a gender perspective or achieving better gender balance. And that's changing. For Ireland, the policy umbrella to address many of these issues has been provided for in our last white paper on defense, with strategies in place are being developed. And when we look at innovation, we can tend to look at it primarily from the perspective of technology, driven by science, technology, engineering, and maths. We don't always look at it from the perspective of institutional relationships, which are mainly people-centric and linked to the humanities and values. Theodore Zeldin asked, when will we make the same breakthroughs in the way we treat each other as we have made in technology? So in the context of today's discussion, it is on our internal environment that I want to dwell for the final few minutes. Achieving diversity in our internal environment is critical, and three points are worthy of consideration. Firstly, breaking down silos. Silos undermine trust, efficiency, and effectiveness. Secondly, striving for diversity and inclusion across teams such as culture, creed, age, sexual orientation, and gender is vital. And thirdly, institutionalizing a gender perspective and improving gender balance are essential. The evidence in the literature is overwhelming. Improvement in gender balance at all levels facilitates better decision-making and creative processes. Therefore, it would seem logical that having enough women in the armed forces will help ensure appropriate positive outcomes. It's not just a political issue. It's not just a market issue. It's not just a civil society issue. It's a military issue because it's a capability issue. As a military leader, your responsibilities are clear, and that is to ensure your organization is fit for purpose and is optimized with capabilities that achieve the best outcomes. Getting gender right in our organizations will, I believe, lead to better outcomes, making us more formidable in areas such as conflict resolution and peacekeeping. To succeed in developing a more diverse and gender-balanced workforce, military leaders must be prepared to stand up to the inevitable pushback, driving commitment and ensuring accountability, even if the initial percep perceptions are negative. Leaders need to do what they believe is right, not just to improve an organization's performance, but to create a better world. Studies show that the larger the gender gap is, the more likely a country is to be involved in interstate or intrastate conflict. 
to be the first to resort to force in such conflicts and to resort to higher levels of violence. What happens to women affects the security, stability, prosperity, corruption, health, regime type and the power of the state. It provides a portal to a link between human security and state security. It is a fact that sexual exploitation and abuse and gender-based violence are part of, if not the main effort, in many conflicts. In some instances they have been codified as war crimes, crimes against humanity, and in certain instances the most terrible of all crimes, the crime of genocide. So it's in this context and the duty of military to society and government, it's no longer good enough to treat the matters of gender, diversity and inclusion as politically correct supporting efforts, but rather to move them to the centre of military's main effort, articulating their interdependence with capability uh, development, and especially in the context of conflict resolution. Quite simply, institutionalising a gender perspective within our military, driving greater gender balance, strengthens us as an organisation, strengthens the institutions of civil society, and strengthens our nation, making us a better reflection of the society we defend, protect and serve. Ireland has embraced UN Security Council Resolution 1325 and the subsequent UN resolutions. We've nested our Defence Forces Action Plan under our National Action Plan. We put significant effort into recruiting more women into our Defence Forces with some success. We've launched our diversity and inclusion strategy and for instance the establishment of women's networks and for that matter indeed LGBT networks in all our commands. We have a number of initiatives aimed at institutionalising a gender perspective and addressing unconscious bias. And by the way, the Defence Force's gender advisor is a man. Women, gender equality, diversity and inclusion in a male-dominated organisation is as much about men as it is about women. The fact that our doctrine has always been nuanced towards that of conflict resolution rather than um, war fighting has meant that we have found it easier to make the case to have more women within our force. However, getting more women into our armed force is not just a military issue, it's a societal issue. Just as achieving greater gender balance in male-dominated organisations is a societal issue, and not just a woman issue. It's also, of course, a leadership issue. Focusing on women in the armed forces, for example, must be done at, in a broader societal context. Studies show how women in most countries are socialised from a young age to fulfil certain stereotypical feminine roles such as caregivers and not to opt for careers such as science, technology, engineering and maths and indeed military. Conversely, the socialisation of young males predisposes them to more masculine pursuits and these observations are reflected in the evidence which show women are less likely to come forward to join the military. Every time I hear a call to try and attract more women towards science, technology, engineering and maths. I say that should read STEM squares, science, technology, engineering, maths and military. There is strong evidence of various gatekeepers such as parents and career counsellors not championing careers in the military for women. E.O. Wilson said, we are drowning in information while starving for wisdom. In the context of women in the armed forces, we have all the information we need. What we lack is the wisdom. Information drives the creation of knowledge and understanding, but the bridge between understanding and wisdom is values. Having understanding without values is more likely to lead to short-termism, populism and unilateralisms, per perspectives that will fail to capture the totality of the opportunity that women in the armed forces bring. Therefore, in addressing complex problems such as women in the armed forces, we should do so from a framework of values, values-based multilateralism, recognising that no one state has all the answers. Desire for change is reflected in the codification of the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, with Goal 5 specifying the attainment of gender equality and empowerment of women and girls. And Jill, I'm delighted that David, who is a co-sponsor of this, um, did such a remarkable achievement. National plans for the Sustainable Development Goals provide a societal framework beneath which national action plans for women, peace and security could be nested. Abuse and violence are not ameliorated by bombs and bullets, and yet we see the conditions for even greater abuse and violence are set to increase as we look to the future. The philosopher Mary Parker Follett said, leadership is not defined by the exercise of power, but by the capacity to increase the sense of power in those who are led. 
the most essential role of the leader is to create more leaders. Institutionalising the Sustainable Development Goals, enhancing gender balance in our militaries, and improving our understanding of security and the interplay between state and human security requires strong values-based leadership, leadership that is vital for multilateralism. And my last paragraph is long. It's gone. <laughs> so in short, we need to have and institutionalise that value-based leadership, not just in the military, but also in the societal institutions that drive the creation of uh, embracing this requirement to institutionalise women in the military as being a normal factor within our countries and not just in the Irish state. Thank you very much. Okay. Technology demands <laughs> that we start at the other end of the table. Okay. The other end of the table. My apologies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, excellencies, general admiral. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the Norwegian Minister of Defence, I'm very uh, thankful for uh, uh, being given the uh, ability and opportunity to come here today and address the topic of uh, women in the Norwegian Armed Forces. This is a topic close to my heart and I believe uh, a very important one. So I will try to uh, focus on two issues. Uh, firstly, why do we need more women in the armed forces? And secondly, how should we proceed to achieve that goal? The military is a peculiar institution. Uh, it both... Um, uh, it inhabits an area both integrated into society and the political sphere, but also in a way separate from uh, the, 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 the society and the, the, the political sphere. The armed forces do not exist in a vacuum. They have themselves understood that greater diversity should be a goal because they cannot afford not to. We face a traditionalist organization facing up the need for modernization. The security uh, policy situation of today uh, is rather gloomy. We see increased tensions uh, between NATO and Russia due to the uh, crisis in U Ukraine. We see uh, asymmetric th threats, uh, terrorism. Um, uh, we see cyber uh, attacks from uh, uh, non-governmental actors as well as governmental actors and ongoing wars in the Middle East. In this situation of uh, instability and unpredictability, we need to make sure that our armed forces deliver operational capability to or in order to face the security challenging challenges around us. And uh, to do so, uh, we of course need to focus on uh, military equipment, modern and updated military equipment. We need to focus on uh, substantial exercises and training. But first and foremost, we must uh, focus on recruiting the right personnel in order to uh, achieve operational <laughs> capability. This is a prerequisite for improving our military. So our nations all rely on searching farther and wider than previously to ensure future military capability. So in the search for talent, no organization can afford to leave out 50% of the population. This is clearly demonstrated when studying Norwegian demographics and social history. The workforce is shrinking, leading to a wider search for talent. Moreover, not only are women fully integrated into the workforce and higher education, 
They are today uh, in majority in the best universities and constitute the main part of the most prestigious university subjects that there is, medicine, law, psychology, not just to mention some of them. This phenomenon is called feminization of society by uh, several social, uh, uh, social uh, scholars. Uh, and it's not only a Norwegian phenomena, it's a phenomena we see a lot of places all around the world. So women are also more professionally mobile than men, seizing opportunities previously um, reserved for men. New female role models are emerging and gender awareness is catching out on in the face of stories of sexual harassment. The armed forces don't uh, only need the strongest among us, the ones that can carry the heaviest backpacks and run uh, quickest. They also needs the, to recruit greater diversity, people with knowledge of science, technology, culture, languages, and social science. I repeat, we need the best suited and the most motivated, regardless of color of the skin or sex. Conscription is a Norwegian institution. It links the armed forces to society. Moreover, it is tied with Norwegian nationhood and egalitarianism, dating back to the constitution of 1814. In current practice, a conscription service is reserved for a select group of individuals through meaningful participation. It is not an add-on to the pool of professional soldiers. It is a separate entity and brand. And in our view, this has proven a recipe for effective capacity building. It is also an affirmation of the continued ties between the population and the armed forces. And not the least, it's a natural engine for talent search across genders. On October 2014, the Norwegian parliament changed the law to extend mandatory conscription to all citizens, both women and men. Universal conscription, we call it. The new law came into effect 1st of January 2015. And Norway is the first country in NATO to give, to give men and women equal rights and obligations when it comes to protecting their country's interest, values, and territory. Now, other countries may follow suit. Sweden is among uh, them. It's a visible reform, and perhaps even a silent revolution. I would say it's a game changer. The state no longer reserves the military profession to men. Men are no longer seen as the natural preference. In effect, it takes gender off the table when it comes to soldiering. This impacts not only the armed forces, but society and individuals. Every year, several thousand girls emerge from their military service, having learned new skills and having been tried and tested. That is bound to affect them as individuals, as well as society at large, and their surroundings. The, 
We do not have a goal uh, that we should obtain 50% female uh, soldiers. We want to recruit the best, uh, the most motivated and the best suited. But after we introduced universal conscription, the amount of female soldiers has increased dramatically. And it's, it's increased from about 12% till now we have 24% of the soldiers, uh, girl soldiers. And I am convinced that these numbers will continue to increase. So how has this uh, gone? The military leadership reports a change in culture as a result of the shift. At the same time, Norwegian soldiers continue their training and service as usual. This is not an experiment suspending ordinary military activity. It is not a game. Our operational capability is too important to enter into such a game. We often get questions, uh, particularly from foreign observers, about public sentiments uh, towards universal conscription. In general, there is very little controversy in this, on this issue. Conscription is still highly regarded and it has become very popular to uh, spend one year in service. Universal conscription is supported by the majority. On the other hand, some commentators uh, claim that it is political correctness gone wild and that critical views are being censored. My take on this is as follows. Having given the order to conscript both genders, we now have to let the armed forces start their job. We have to allow them leeway to develop their practice in selection and training that ensures sustained operational capability. We have researchers who monitor progress and give their honest and candid feedback. And we do insist that there should be no different spheres for male and female soldiers, or discrimination, or harassment. Women must feel truly welcome. There must not exist mechanisms to keep them out, or to keep them in their place. And the transition is going well. I will quote our chief of defense then when visiting the military women's network uh, meeting in January this year. He said, I have had no reports from my units of women performing under standard. On the contrary, Women conscripts are highly motivated and well suited. They are selected and they report that they enjoy the military service very well, even better than the male soldiers do. There are still myths surrounding women in the military profession. One particular stubborn one is that women in combat are said to invoke the pro protective instincts of their male colleagues, thus um, um, distracting these men from the war fighting tasks. It is sometimes referred to as the Israeli myth since it's supposedly based on Israeli experiences in the War of Independence in 1948. There have been very few uh, studies uh, to support that myth. Israeli historians refuted this myth more than 20 years ago. In fact, the Israeli defense forces are moving towards greater gender integration in their combat forces. The international trend is more and more often that women and men fight side by side. 
and a number of women, women are receiving commendations for their bravery. Truth be told, women have served in the Norwegian armed forces for decades. The commitment to attract women into the armed forces is where it all starts. If determination is strong, results are more likely to follow. If dedication is half-hearted, failure is much more likely to follow. In the case of policies towards women in the armed forces, we see national cultures shining through. Gender roles are central to how a society is organized. So also in the case of the military. Therefore, one practice that works for one country may not necessarily work for other countries. We have all our, our own idiosyncrasies that guide our practice. And we also experience trial and error. But the clearest lessons learned is the following. Structural barriers and enablers make a big difference. I've already highlighted universal conscription. But selection practices and marketing campaigns may be other examples. For instance, in Norway, we always, in all our campaigns, in all our pamphlets, we now always show a lot of pictures of female officers and soldiers. Norway is often boosted to have some of the most gender equal policies in the world. In some areas, that's also the case. We have among the highest rates of uh, women in the workforce. More than 60% of the students of higher education are women. Parental leaves are generous. But the military may also boost some strong accomplishments. The armed forces, uh, the Norwegian armed forces, were made gender equal in 1985 when all positions became accessible to men and women. In 1992, we saw the first female fighter pilot. In 1995, the first female submarine commander. Currently, the chief of Air Force is a woman, and second in command of the army is a woman. The first female UN force commander was Major General Kristin Lund in 2014 in Cyprus. She currently leads the, the UN uh, truce supervision in the Middle East, UNSO. These military women have made the rank after decades of dedication and no lack of persistence. The rate of service women, women is still too low. It's under 12%. 12 but we are seeing a gradual increase. We are on the right path. And I'm convinced that the introduction of the universal conscription will help us and will increase the number of uh, female service women in the years to come. So I will like to end this note that we are on the right path. However, things will not automatically fall into place. If we are to deliver on the pledge of a reinforced gender perspective, as well as gender balancing, there needs to be a steady focus on the problem areas. One such area is the challenge of achieving a decent work-life balance. It takes dedication and will to achieve this balance. And it should not be up to the parent. This is a concern for the leadership. Establishing flexible career paths makes sense in which it is acceptable to occasionally move sideways instead of upwards, to rest on the landing 
between steps. Norway is a stretched out country geographically with long distances from north to the south. Our armed forces are positioned outside the areas where the new urban generation probably want to live, far away from the major cities and towns. So beneficial commute options must be upheld. This is good family policy. Fewer international deployments have led to let less pressure on the remaining parents. But we need a good system in place for periods in which deployments may become more frequent. We want our personnel to be parents and to have a full life and to be focused on their work. This is a never ending goal. Our military has not escaped sexual harassment. In a study of uh, 2010, negative sides of military culture were identified as one of the main causes for women leaving the military. A military psychologist recently argued that the reason military women have not joined the Me Too campaign is that they do not like to be seen as victims. The cases are there, but the report, the report, the reporting them is an anathema to most. For any country with the ambition of increasing its rate of service women, it's imperative to really want it, to comply a concerted effort. Ask yourself and your staff what make people leave? Deal with the tough issues. Do not disregard the so-called soft issues. They may prove to be harder than you think. So I'm very happy to be here today and to listen to the experiences from my Norwegian, from my Nordic colleagues. And I think this is important arenas where we can learn from each other and. Uh, Hopefully, we will all achieve in moving the gender balance in the right direction in our armed forces. Thank you so much. Now, I'm thinking it's uh, Major Niskanen who's next. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking with the technology. Why did you listen? Indeed. <laughs> when the AI comes, we'll all be taking over some computers. Please, Major. Thank you. Admiral, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege and an honor to be here today uh, in such distinguished company. Uh, during the next few minutes, I'd like to share with you some thoughts on the Finnish perspective of uh, women in the armed forces. Um, my perspective is probably going to be a bit more tactical than, uh, than what the previous distinguished speakers gave you. So hopefully it will... It will um, uh, give some insight on the, on the whole picture on this issue. I'd like to begin by, by laying out the, the frame, framework for um, Finnish defense. And defense is really the, the key word, the key term here. Uh, Finland does not have armed forces. It's all about defense. And uh, so, so that's why we call them defense forces. Homeland defense and uh, ensuring uh, the territorial sovereignty is, is really the, um, the, the, the main business for, for us. And the, the three first points are the key points for, uh, for Finnish defense. At the same time, simultaneously, Finland is also very strongly commi committed to uh, international cooperation, not just within Europe, but within also the United Nations and um, an OSCE uh, framework. And she is very active in, uh, participa in participating in uh, international peacekeeping missions and, uh, and uh, uh, 
commit in uh, international burden sharing. Concept of comprehensive security is something that uh, we often uh, get questions about. Uh, this is uh, something that dates back to, uh, this is a historical question, dates back to, to uh, Finnish Winter War uh, during the Second World War. Uh, Finland at that time was really a nation in arms, so it was not just an effort for the defense only, but for the whole society. The desired end state for this uh, concept of comprehensive security is of course securing vital functions of the society and guaranteeing well-being and security for Finnish citizens in any and all circumstances. It is, it would be a joint effort by the administration and business life, as well as NGOs and individual citizens. The Finns rank very high on, uh, on uh, statistical polls when asking for their um, will to defend their country uh, in case of war. One of the highest in Europe, going up to 92%. But it's not just a, a pretty concept. We really do plan, prepare, and train within the whole society for, uh, for uh, different types of uh, disruptions, crises, and even uh, scenarios where military force would be used against our country. So that's really the framework for Finnish defense. Um, and I'd like to take two minutes to, um, to present myself. Um, I am an officer, a major in the Finnish Air Force. Joined the force in 1997 as a conscript. I volunteered for military service and after one year of military service decided to, to um, go for a career uh, in, in the Air Force. Been trained as a fighter pilot, uh, 15 years active in a, in a uh, fighter squadron uh, in, in eastern Finland. And uh, like I would said during the introductions, nowadays I teach air warfare studies at the National Defense University. Uh, during the little over 20 years that I've been in the force, I've seen the Finnish society change and I've seen the defense forces change. So the Finnish defense still relies on, on conscription and reserves created by the system of conscriptions, of conscription, about 28 conscripts trained every year. Women may volunteer, but they do not get the call out. So uh, compared with a, with a Norwegian system of, of universal conscription, which is different to begin with, but then again, um, it's, I kind of want to stress that, uh, that it's only the Finnish young men who get called. But the women who volunteer enjoy equal opportunities. They have to fulfill the same requirements. There's absolutely no difference. All the requirements are the same. And uh, for example, as as a, as, a, as a fighter pilot went through exactly the same training as, um, as my male colleagues. Which, from my point of view, kind of makes sense because it's all about competence, it's all about military capability, and gender really plays no role in uh, how well you, you, you fly your plane. From the very beginning, all services, branches, and any type of training has been open to women. No position is excluded for women. Military service was made available for Finnish women in 1995, so a little bit later than in Norway, for example. Since then, 
well over 8,000 Finnish women have served. Of these women, it's about 60 to 70 percent who qualify for leadership training during their military service. Uh, that goes for uh, NCOs as well as reserve officers. The number of the percentage is quite high and we think this probably because they're all volunteers that they're more motivated maybe than, um, than, uh, than their male colleagues. 10% qualify for office, officer training and I should say apply for officer training. Probably more, more would qualify but talking about career officer as shown here. So after one year of military service uh, people who decide to go for a career uh, will apply for a military academy, which is called National Defense University. I think you can see the hashtag. They boast to be the most disciplined university in Finland. <laughs> I'll leave it to you to, to decide whether that's really true or not. Uh, there you can see the you can you can see the programs on the slide. Uh, and uh, as I like to talk about myself, <laughs> I'll just say that I just finished a general staff officer's course. So um, this is where I am at my career, uh, at, uh, uh, soon 44 years of age um, and, and the rank of major. Doctoral program is something that doesn't uh, touch, uh, doesn't concern uh, each and every one. It's uh, also on a voluntary basis. Still have a few remarks on uh, on uh, Finnish uh, military women in crisis management operations. As I said before, it's both through United Nations, European Union, NATO, and OSCE operations that we perceive uh, Finnish women working towards um, uh, a common goal of uh, of peacekeeping. About 25% of Finnish civil servants in these missions are women. However, the overall number, including military personnel, is just about 5% of the overall percentage. The gender aspect is a very important element in crisis management operations, and Finland is committed to recruiting more women in, uh, in operations. Uh, there's definitely similar points uh, at my... Uh, uh, that the distinguished speaker from Norway touched upon on, on, uh, during her presentation. So I'd like to conclude this very short presentation, just a few more remarks on where we are today. And the first one is really something that um, came up when, during the both previous presentations at the Fonds Forces, not in a vacuum, but definitely uh, a very important part of the society. And we, we always say that the Defense Forces is a Finnish society in miniature size. And as the Finnish society is diverse and women are very active from the very top positions politically, in business life, so on, then maybe we'll see the same, uh, same development happening in the Defense Forces in the future. In the Defense Forces, women are fully integrated, but still few in numbers. It's only been uh, a little more than, than 20 years that women have been serving. And my last point, and this is concerning especially the peacekeeping missions, it is clear to us that more female peacekeepers are needed because there are a lot of sensitive, difficult issues that need to be worked with the local populations. And sometimes for, depending on the culture, depending on the situation, any type of scenario, it is probably a little bit easier for uh, for local uh, women 
to go and, and, and take, a, take something up with a female peacekeeper instead of a male in a uniform. So, with these few points, uh, I'd like to present the Finnish perspective on, the Finnish, uh, on, on women in uh, defense forces. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Major. Yes, Lieutenant, please. Thank you. Thank you for uh, letting me come here and speak today. I will talk about the Swedish perspective. So I start direct. Uh, are you sure about that? Uh, or can women do military service? That's questions I got before I started my basic training in 2010. It wasn't from people within the armed forces. It was from people outside. People I met, like teachers, classmates, friends, they really had no clue. My name is Emma Muller, as uh, I was, um, yeah, and I'm a second lieutenant in the Swedish Air Force. And I will tell you about my experience when uh, I started my military career from 2010 until today. I have worked both as a soldier and I'm currently working as an officer. Swedish Armed Forces works together with other parts of the society. The prejudice I met before I started my basic training was from people outside, which means that the armed forces is not an autonomous unit. We're not working alone. It was a question about whether women shall be or not be a part of the armed forces, which also means that the armed forces is a place for everyone. We, have, we really need women in the Air Force or in the whole army or in the Marine. We, Every unit needs women. Sweden, together with other countries, do have international framework, like UN Declaration of Human Rights and Women, Peace and Security. These framework are the core to our national framework, consisting of legislation, policies, programs and documents. And from our national framework, we, the armed forces has visions and steering documents. One of those is gender mainstreaming. It's something we work a lot of with in the armed forces. Basically, the gender mainstreaming is found in political goals, legislation, and steering documents. And it mostly refers to the strategic level. But it, all, but it all comes down to every unit. Every unit needs to have action plans. What should we do? How should we do implement gender mainstreaming in our organization? There are three perspectives that represent armed forces gender mainstreaming. It's the rights, which means that women and men alike shall have the same rights and obligations to serve in the armed forces. And with equal opportunities to be effective in order to advance on equal terms. We also have the recruitment and retention, which means that the Swedish Armed Forces is a modern employer and must reflect the society it, which is it established to protect and serve. As to say, the society's core values of democracy, human rights, and integrity of the state. And the third part is the war fighting capability. And it's the third perspective. And that means that the war fighting capability will increase and strengthens when we recruit the most suitable soldier 
from a wider selection. To, su to succeed and implement the gender mainstreaming, the, the armed forces is educating the personnel in gender mainstreaming. <laughs> but it doesn't matter what position you have or in what organization you work. Everybody gets this education. Everything to make it as a daily work. We don't have it something you add on. You should see it as any other education or any other working. One of the actions taken by the Air Force to implement gender mainstreaming and due to the action plans, the Air Force do have mentors for all new officers. Both men and women. The main purpose of that is to get a closer connection to the organization and someone you can talk to, like if you get leadership problems or you have concerns about something. You can always ask your mentor. Sometimes you don't want to go to your commander with the questions you have. So I use my mentor for that. If you're going to the statistics, one part of the goal the Swedish Armed Forces has is to increase the amount of women. And you might wonder how many women do the Swedish Armed Forces have? The Swedish Armed Forces do have 13% women today, and we have had that for almost 10 years. It hasn't increased or decreased. The only part is the officers. It has increased, but not so much. <coughs> the amount of soldiers has both gone up and down during the last 10 years, but it's still, it's steady. During my first month of basic training, we were 50% women and 50% men. That's very unique. I will probably never be in a unit like that again. After my conscript service, I started to work as a soldier. It was a very small unit working with psychological operations. For almost two and a half years on that platoon, there was never another woman there. <coughs> At first, it surprised me because it was a very big contrast from what I had before, but I got used to it. I had very good colleagues. They didn't care whether I was a woman or I'm a man because we, we all had the same mission. We were there to be very good soldiers. But the fact to be the only woman in that platoon could complicate things sometimes. Because to be able to succeed with, psycholog with <coughs> psychological operations, you sometimes need a woman. Because a woman can communicate with other people that Maybe not the men can. I, did, I didn't get that job because I was the strongest or fastest or the most accurate shooter. It was because the military capability would increase. I did get that job because I was a woman, because I am a woman because I had something that other soldiers didn't have. I had the ability to communicate with 50% of the population in Afghanistan when we went there in 2012. One way to increase the amount of women in the armed forces is the gender-neutral conscript service. <coughs> 
2010 was the last year of conscript service for men. Since then, we had a system based on recruitment and voluntary people, both men and women. From January this year, we do now have a gender neutral conscript service. It is based on voluntary personnel and conscripts. And until the end of this year, we are in, in need of 4,000 recruits to fill the em empty employments in the armed forces. Last summer, when I became an officer, uh, since then, when I started to work, I have uh, worked in training new recruits. And I will continue doing that because it's a very good job. A recruit or a soldier does not only learn how to be a fast and accurate shooter. The hardest part to learn a, so a soldier, according to me, is when to fire and especially when not to fire. These decisions must be based on the core values. The military mission involves rights and obligations to the use of force. We might put ours or other people's lives in danger. That's why we have to, has to be very competent. We need to be professional. We need to have good or even great values. The recruits do have a lot of participation during their conscript service. We, we, we educate them in what is sexual harassment, discrimination, and how we should act around those questions. We edu educate them in what it is and how to act if it happens, because as we all know, it does. The development Development in those questions are going forward. 2010, when I did my conscript service, we didn't have any of that in our education. And today, they are having a lot. From the first day. Since we do know it happened with um, sexual harassment, the military or the Swedish Armed Forces was a part of the Me Too movement. It spread widely on social media all over the world. And as we know, the military is a part of the society. So the movement spread in the armed forces as well. The movement made it clear that it doesn't matter where you work or with what. There is always employers that do have problems with individuals. I think it's important to talk about the fact that it is individuals, not the whole organization. It is one or several individuals that is the problem. Because we do have legislation, we have framework, policies, we have all the documents. All we need is to talk about it. The main purpose of the movement was to make the military a better place for everyone and to show that even if we are good, we're not, we're not finished. We have to work more. Our, our Supreme Commander made it very clear that that type of behavior is not okay. He said, actions like that is not acceptable. The employees that cannot live according to the armed forces core values has nothing to do in the armed forces. So, if we go back to those questions. Even though we have things we have to work on and we are not perfect, but we do need more women in the organization, just to be more equal. So if I could answer those questions, 
now, or I wish I could 2010. But today, I'm really sure about that. And women can do military service. They even should do. And I want to do it because it's a great job. Thank you.